You know, what a privilege to be here in, in this year of mercy, on the Feast of Divine Mercy, to talk about an image of mercy, you know, our Savior Jesus Christ and the image on the shroud. And what an ideal place to be here in New Zealand for this Eucharistic Convention on this particular day. You know, I may be 10,000 miles from home, but I, I feel like I'm right where God wants me to be, and that you are right where God wants you to be as well. All right? We all share some appreciation for the Shroud or we would not be here. But where has it been in its history? And, and what are these triangles there? And what are those shapes there? And what's that line across the chin? And what's that there? We're going to answer all those questions and then some. But the most important question is, what is God trying to say to me? What is the message of the Shroud? And if we're willing to give some reflection to that question, and it can be a life-changing experience to the degree that we allow it to be. You know, all the shroud images you're going to see have been made with copyright permission of Barry Schwartz. He was the photographer of the Shroud of Turin Research Project in 1978. Now, the PowerPoint you're about to see is mainly a summary of this document, the critical summary. All right? It was composed by Dr. Jackson and his associates at the Turin Shroud Center. Uh, tens of thousands of hours of scientific research over the last four decades, and they summarized it all in 75 pages and another 30 pages of reference. And I'll show you how you can download this for free. All right? I don't have a table back there because I'm not selling anything, but you can download this for free from the website, okay? And that way you can pursue it on your own. Now, here's Dr. Jackson on the left. This was at the most recent International Shroud Conference held in St. Louis back in October 2014. All right. He and his bishop, Michael Sheridan of the Diocese of Colorado Springs, they share a vision that the Shroud has been left to us for a purpose. And that providing people, if we provide people with factual information, they could come to their own reasoned judgment regarding its authenticity. So in September of 2018, 2014, the uh, Bishop Sheridan decreed the formation of the American Confraternity of the Holy Shroud. That people may use the Shroud as a most precious sacramental. And that's where this is leading. The Shroud is a sacrament. It points us toward Jesus and the Blessed Sacrament. And as we deepen our relationship there, it helps us to become saints. Okay, that is where we're going with this. Not here to win a scientific debate. Each of you can see the facts and decide for yourself. Uh, the format we're going to take here um, is uh, today we're going to be divided in two parts. There's just so much information. All right, we're going to begin with the features of the shroud, and then we'll cover its early history up to about the year 1900. All right, and we'll be done, and we're going to stop for some questions and answers. And I need to be done, you know, at 1:30, and I'll, I'll hit that. And then tomorrow we'll pick it up at that spot and allow time for questions for the shroud about the 20th century. Okay? Uh, tomorrow, whoops. Yeah, tomorrow we'll do its more recent history, some current research, and a few closing comments, all right? And I invite you to, to read or listen to this next slide. I'll read it out loud in case those of you in the back can't see it. But kind of prepare our hearts for what is it God wants us to get out of this, this next uh, few minutes here. One of our patron saints in America, St. Elizabeth Ann Seton, had this to say. When you begin to study, look up to him and think, Oh Lord, how worthless this knowledge would be if it were not for the enlightening of my mind for your service or for making me more useful to my fellow men. And so I believe this gives us a motivation for learning, you know, to be scholars, yes, but, but more importantly, become saints. And so we begin. Then, having bought a linen shroud, Joseph took him down, wrapping him in a linen, and laid him in the tomb. And here we have a depiction down here of Good Friday. The long linen shroud with the back side of the body against the ground, the front side with that, and then after the resurrection, we see the shroud displayed like this with the back side of the body there, and the front side there. Is this linen spoken of in the Gospels and the shroud of Turin, are they one and the same? <clears throat> now, the shroud itself is exactly two cubits by eight cubits, which is 14 feet three inches long by three feet seven inches high. If you can see the face there, the man in the shroud is five feet ten inches tall. He is 175 pounds. And the blood stains that have been analyzed, you can see the blood stain from the side there, uh, have all been shown to be consistently from a male with type AB blood. Now what I want to do is, let's take the left hand side of this and we're going to blow it up for you, okay? Can everybody see the face here now? 
And this is actually a little closer to actual size. This is about half the size of the shroud, okay? You can see the face there. Uh, the most prominent feature are these scorch marks here. And these scorch marks happened in 1532. There was a fire <clears throat> that went through 16 layers of the shroud, the way it was folded, but it did not destroy the shroud. On the back side here, this is a Holland backing. It was sewn on by poor Claire nuns after that fire. This corner is missing, all right? What you see is a Holland backing that was sewn on in the 16th century. These are patches that the nuns sewed on. And there you can see the right arm. You can see an exit wound of blood coming from the wrist, and as well as blood stains on that arm and the blood stain there. These are water stains here, all right? Now we're gonna look at the left-hand side. The body would have been laid on, all right? Here is the back of the head, and you can see the blood stains from the cap of thorns there. You can see scourge marks across the back, the blood stains across the back, scourge marks the length of the body. You'll be able to see these better when I show you a photographic negative in a minute here. And down here you see the feet. There's the blood coming off the right foot, blood coming off the left foot. Again, these scorch marks. You see the patches. Now right here you see the change in coloration. <clears throat> okay, about 150 years <clears throat> after the poor Claire nuns sewed these on, they started to come off. And so the parish priest in turn at that time was Blessed Sebastian Valfrey. And he had these sewn on, those four there, and then that one there. And it said that he wept as the shroud was being sewn. St. Charles Borromeo has wept on the shroud. St. Francis de Sales has wept on the shroud. Many saints have wept on the shroud. And then these holes right here, all right, we're going to get to them later, they did not happen. And the, they were on the, the shroud centuries before the fire. We'll get to them later. Right? This is a close-up of the, the shroud itself. It is 100% linen. Okay? And there's a difference between cotton and linen. The shroud is linen. And it is for this reason that the corporal that's placed on an altar is linen. Because our Lord's body was laid on a linen corporal. Right? It's called a three-in-one herringbone weave. And what it is, you go over three, under one, over three, under one, and then it shifts, kind of like a stair step ladder. Now, this was a common stitching in ancient uh, Palestine in Jerusalem, all right? And it was found just before, during, and after the time of Christ. It is never found in Europe at any time in history, called a three-in-one herringbone weave, okay, pure linen. Now, what you see on the left here is what we call the uh, cloth image. When you see the shroud, that is what you see. All right. The photographic negative on the right wasn't taken until after 1898. And of course, people in this room are old enough to know what a photographic negative is. It shows everything reversed. Okay. But interestingly, when we look at the cloth image, that is actually a mirror image. Because if you think of the image being imposed, think of my left hand here as being the body, and my right hand being the cloth. When the body goes onto the cloth, and the image is imprinted, I pull it back, and the right hand is like looking into a mirror. And the left hand is what the face really would have looked like. So this stain right here that looks like a three, a blood stain, that's what the body would have looked like. Right? Everything is reversed and inverted. Pilate's next move was to take Jesus and have him scourged. And the, the scourging would have been done with a flagrum. And there are four kinds of flagrums on display in a museum in Rome. This one is, partic is uh, consistent with the wounds that we see across the body, front and back. All right. Each lash would have resulted in six wounds. These pairs of metal balls on the back side of them are sharp. Each, each strike on the back would have produced six wounds. Right. Now, if we look across the front, we can see the scourge marks across the front here. This is a water stain, okay? So that, that four-sided thing you see is a water stain. Right there where I'm pointing is a blood stain. And it's on the right-hand side, and that's where it would have been on the body. But when it went onto the cloth, it would end up being left, of course, right? And you see the blood stain coming off the left wrist. And across the back here, you see the scourge marks extending from the neck all the way down here. Now, they're, they're very distinctive with those pairs of you know, balls we saw that hit the back. If you notice up around the shoulder, it becomes less distinct. And this is consistent with a sequence that after the scourging, if a heavy beam was placed across his back, whether it was a patibulum or the cross, that heavy beam would have rubbed and mutilated the tissue. And so this area here that's less distinct is consistent with a scourging followed by a heavy beam mutilating the tissue. 
Then the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and fixed it on his head. And here we see the blood stains from the cap of thorns. All right, the scourge marks the entire length of the body. Our Lord was wearing nothing. All right? And the feet, you see the blood stains coming off the feet there as well. Now this is a close-up that's been magnified 32 times of the area across the small of the back. Right, there's some blood pooling there, back there. And this has been analyzed several times. It is human blood. It is type AB blood. But a unique feature about it is the color. If you've ever seen blood, when it hits the floor after a bloody nose or whatever, it, it turns brown. And within a day or two, it's dark. So how could it be that after all these centuries, that blood could still be bright red? Well, it was discovered in the 20th century that when a person is tortured and suffers a tremendous loss of blood, and perhaps in the scourging, 20, 30, 40 percent of his blood volume or more may have been lost, the body responds by producing a protein. And the protein comes from your liver. It's called bilirubin. It is a bright red protein. It goes into the bloodstream. It goes into the blood cells, and you see the body is starved for oxygen. And this protein speeds up the release of oxygen out of the red blood cells into the body. All right? And so once that bilirubin gets into the blood, and then it comes out, it stays red until the end of time. All right? So the point here is that this is not just blood from anyone. This is blood from someone who suffered a tremendous loss of blood. And doctors believe our Lord died from hypovolemic shock. He bled to death in addition to having three hours of fighting asphyxiation. <clears throat> you know, if we stop to consider the unspeakable pain of having nails driven through our Lord's feet and wrists, we can begin to appreciate the great love that he has for each of us and that he willingly suffered this for each of us alone. In the Garden of Gethsemane, as he contemplated what was about to happen, he understood in a very complete way what this was going to feel like. You know, fear of the unknown is bad enough, but we know our Lord had a divine nature and a human nature. And so he understood in a complete way what this was going to feel like, how every nerve and fiber was going to feel from this, this terrible, terrible torture coming up. The anxiety was so great that it caused him to sweat blood. It's a very rare condition known as hematidrosis. Right? Can you imagine the terror of knowing this? And yet he said, not my will, but yours be done. Now this image is from the darkest area of the shroud. On the cloth image, it's the nose. Right? And the nose was thought to be wrapped tightest with the linen. We'll get to image formation tomorrow, huh? how they may have been. But it points out a trait called superficiality. This is a very unique feature about the shroud, because if you look at this, if there were paint there, you'd see some cementation, you know, with the pigments and fibers going, but there's no cementation there. And matter of fact, you have to get back about 10 feet from the actual shroud in order to see the image. If you're within 10, 8 or 10 feet, you just don't see much at all. It's extremely superficial. Now we're going to take, and by the way, each one of these threads here is anywhere from 70 to 120 linen fibers. It varies so much because it was hand spun, okay? So this is one thread, and you know how tiny a thread is, made up of anywhere from 70 to 120 little microscopic fibers. And what we're going to do is we're going to take one of those threads, we're going to chop it off endwise, and we're going to look at it in cross-section. And this cross-section of a single thread illustrates the extreme superficiality of the image. Only the uppermost fibers are yellowed. Okay? And if an artist were trying to do this on a thread, no matter what kind of pigment you take, or liquid or paint of any kind, and you had a, let's say you had a paintbrush that was just one hair, and you dipped that one hair in your painting stuff, and you, you placed it on the thread, it would soak through all of those fibers, and all of them would be colored with a pigment. But the shroud shows no pigment, all right? So this is one feature that, that cannot be duplicated, is this extreme superficiality. And so how did it get on there? Chemically, these fibers are the same as those. They're just yellowed. It's believed that it was a burst of light, and once again, I'll cover that again tomorrow when we get into the image formation. Now, another way to, to show their superficiality is <clears throat> something called a backlighting. Now, here's what the shroud looks with light coming from the front. Everybody can see things pretty clearly. All right? Now, if you take away light from the front and put a light behind it, anything that goes through the entire thread is going to show through. So, obviously, the scorch marks show up, the patches show up, the blood stains show up the water stains. What you don't see is the image. The image is gone. See? On the real shroud, lighting from behind, 
the image disappears because it is just so superficial. The linen itself is 35 one hundredths of a millimeter thick. Now, paper clip <clears throat> is about one millimeter thick. All right, this is Dr. Jackson measuring the thickness of the shroud in 1978. And at 35 of a millimeter, this linen is three times thinner than a paper clip. So it's extremely fine. Now we have <clears throat> evidence from archaeology and geology that places the shroud in Jerusalem. <clears throat> These are the steps from the temple courtyard. When the temple stood, Jesus would have seen these steps and walked that ground. And as we know, in 70 AD, the temple was destroyed. These are the, the steps from that temple that are preserved. They're in Jerusalem today. And the dirt that is on these is found on the shroud. It is found in places where his body would have contacted the ground. It's found on the nose and the knees and the soles of the feet. All right? This particular type of dirt is called travertine argonite. It is found only in Jerusalem and a handful of places on earth. And it's also found in the shroud. Now we turn to botany, study of plants. In 1978, Dr. Max Fry, a Swiss criminologist, took samples of pollen grains from the shroud. He took the sticky tape, and they would place the sticky tape up on the shroud and pull it away, and then make slides of it. And you can see pollen grains on it from this. And he identified over 200 pollen grains, uh, 49 different kinds. 13 of those species were unique to Jerusalem, and several other species were unique to Constantinople, where we believe the shroud was for five centuries. This is a close-up of one of those pollen grains found. Right? It's called Filaria gustifolia. Now we're to give you a scale. It's two microns, micrometers. There are a thousand microns in a millimeter. So pollen grains are extremely fine. Right? Now the most commonly found one was this one right here. Gundelia trinoforti. It was found on either side of the head. It's sometimes called the crown of thorns plant. And when it sprouts, it looks like what we call thistle, and it's just a few weeks old. But as it grows, it increases in diameter and gets longer thorns, and it breaks away like a tumbleweed. I don't know if you have tumbleweeds here, but we have tumbleweeds in Nebraska. And uh, many believe that this could have been used for the cap of thorns, but there's also another pollen grain found in the shroud called the Zizipus Christ thorn plant. And either one of those could have been used for the cap of thorns. Uh, there's an entire book written on this by a, a, an Israeli, a Jewish botanist, Avi Noam Danin, spent his whole life living in the Holy Land. There you can see Israel. He's written an entire book on this. This is the book cover if you wanted to pursue that further, called The Botany of the Shroud. Another trait of the shroud is that there is 3D information encoded on it. And this is most unique because normal pictures don't show this. Well, how did they take this picture? Down here at the bottom, it says VP8. All right, the VP8 image analyzer was developed by NASA in the 1960s to map the surface of the moon. Because they were curious, what did the back side of the moon look like? The same side of the moon is always facing us. So we have never seen the back side of the moon, unless you're an Apollo astronaut. And during one of the early Apollo missions, they took the VP8 image analyzer it was on the Apollo spacecraft, and as it orbited the moon, it took pictures and put them together. So we, what it is, it's sensitive to light intensities, so it can tell where the valleys and the hills are at. Very, very sensitive to light intensities, okay? Um, regular, uh, like, much like mapping the ocean floor with a sonar, okay? Now, regular pictures do not contain distance light intensity information. They contain color information. If you take a regular picture or a black and white picture and put it underneath the VP8, it will look less clearer than it is now. The shroud, a picture of the shroud, is the only picture on Earth that will produce this 3D image. All right? And what it shows is the distance of the body from the cloth at the instant the image was formed. And I'll get to that again tomorrow, but what I'm seeing is the nose here, if there's a cloth over your nose, it's touching, isn't it? And that is the most raised part. The light intensity is greater there. The eyes would be a few millimeters underneath the cloth. And so they're a little bit darker. And so areas where the face is closest to the cloth will appear lighter on the photographic negative, like the, the beard and the nose, right? And those areas that are farther away will appear darker, like the eyes. Take a look at these two cheeks. Can you see a difference? The right cheek and the left cheek. The right cheek is lighter. Now, the forensic pathologist from Los Angeles County, who has autopsied thousands of bodies, has analyzed these films, and he's convinced that that right cheek is swollen. And we know from the Gospels that our Lord was struck in the face. And this lighter area points a raised relief on the right cheek compared to the left cheek. 
A final feature is called image drop-off, right? If you look here, it looks like almost somebody took a line and there's a straight line going up and down, straight line going up and down. You don't see the ears. That's because there are no side images on the shroud, not on the head, not on the body, not on the legs. Everything is vertically aligned, which tells us that the image was not formed by direct contact. If it had been formed by direct contact, like say sweat, if you just put a bunch of sweat or something on you and wrap it around, it, the face would be grossly distorted. There would be a wraparound distortion and the, foot, and the face would be about a foot wide. But in fact, the image is vertically aligned in the plane of gravity. And we believe that that played a part as the, as the cloth claps through the body. And again, I'll get to that tomorrow. Okay, early history of the shroud. The most frequently suggested date for Jesus' death is Friday, April 3rd, the year 33 AD. However, another date could have been Friday, April 7th, at the year 30 AD. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. And Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there. And the cloth that had been on Jesus' head lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Notice the reference to plural here. We're talking about more than one cloth. You know, perhaps the apostle saw something like this. There's the linen shroud. There's the long strip, which was used to keep it on the body. Otherwise, it's going to fall off. And there's the head cloth rolled up in a place by itself. Now, we'll look at each of these three here. Let's take the, the, the linen the strip first, okay? <clears throat> if we look at the shroud, right below this yellow arrow, you can see a line that goes across there. It's about 14 feet across, and we know at some point in its history, this part of the shroud has been removed and then sewn back on. There's a different stitching pattern here. Could this strip have been used to wrap around the, the outside of the linen to keep it on the body and then re-sewn on later? All right? Now, it would have needed to be long enough to wrap around the body at the head, the body a couple times and be tied off at the feet. Um, Jews did not bury the body like a mummy. That was the Egyptians. Like Egyptians used many, many strips. Jews to this day in their funerals wrap the body in a, sinon, a single linen cloth, a single linen cloth wrapped from the outside with a long strip to keep it on. And they've been doing this for thousands of years. Now this is a simulation of what this might look like. This is Dr. Jackson and his wife, Rebecca. Rebecca's Jewish and she became Catholic in the 1990s. Explains two things. Number one, why was this strip taken off? Number one, to wrap around the body, to keep it on the linen on the body. And secondly, this line right here, recall a few slides back, I told you that those parts of the body that were closest to the linen were brighter. And if you had a tight strip around the chin, that would be consistent with this white line we see of that, of that red arrow. Right, but what about the cloth that had been on Jesus' head. Well, it would have been consistent with Jewish sensibilities to do this. We believe this, this cloth was on his head from the site of the crucifixion until, the, until he reached the tomb. Covering the, cloth, covering the face with a cloth <clears throat> would have preserved his dignity and it would have caught his blood. There was a lot of blood coming off from his nose and eyes. And in Jewish culture, the, the blood is part of the body. And so taking this cloth with you and placing it in the tomb is placing the body in its completeness. This, so this head cloth would have been there on Good Friday and not taken off on Sunday morning, which I, as a child, that's what I thought happened, all right? But this is by itself. There's no image on this cloth, all right? It is, many believe that this is that head cloth. It is known as the Sudarium of Oviedo. In 614 AD, this cloth was carried out of the Holy Land by the conquering, uh, ahead of the conquering Persian forces, and it ultimately arrived in Oviedo, Spain, before the year 711 AD, and has been there to this day. It is 33 inches wide by 21 inches. It too is linen, but it's an over one, under one, a checkerboard pattern, right? Now we could test this cloth to see if it was the one with the shroud by matching it up with blood stains from the back of the head. Now this is the area at the back of the head these are the blood stains <clears throat> where the blood would be exuded from the body. Now imagine the body with the head cloth wrapped around and then being laid down on the shroud. Within a few seconds, the blood exuding from the body would have penetrated through that sudarium onto the shroud linen, 
before it was taken off, right? Now, here is a transparency of the shroud at the back of the head. And here's a transparency of the sedarium. These are one-to-one -one scale, actual size transparencies. And when you overlap them, <clears throat> there's a perfect match between the blood stains on each. Right? The shape and size of that blood stain on the sedarium is exactly the same as the shape and size of the blood stain on the shroud. And they're both type AB blood. So where did the shroud go? <clears throat> Well, we know that uh, in about the year 44 AD, there was a persecution in Jerusalem. And it's believed that St. Peter himself carried the shroud with him. And this is alluded to in a document that we've never seen, but some of the church fathers had seen it. In fact, uh, St. Jerome got a glimpse of this document. It's called the Lost Gospel of the Hebrews, right? We don't have it anymore, but St. Jerome saw it. And in reading that, it was stated that Peter fled from Jerusalem to Antioch with the sacred linens from the, uh, that where Christ was buried in, right? And it arrives in, in Antioch about the year 44 AD, and then we don't hear much about it anymore, which isn't surprising because in those first centuries, there was a lot of persecution. And if you look in the Acts of the Apostles, we don't see a word about the Blessed Virgin Mary. And yet she was around, right? She was being protected. If, she, if her whereabouts had been advertised through letters, it would, she would put her in great danger, and so too with the shroud. So that's why we don't see much mention of it in the first few centuries, right? <clears throat> now, about the year 540, it was taken to Kanlian into central Turkey. And I'll cover that in just a minute. There was a, uh, another invading Persian force. And then shortly after that, it was taken to Constantinople, which is present-day Istanbul, Turkey, in 574, where it remained for several centuries after that, okay? Now, so here's a brief summary of what we just covered there, okay? <clears throat> In 540, when the Persian forces were invading Antioch, the bishop at that time was Patriarch Ephraimius, right? And Ephraimius was known as a warrior bishop. He was a very devoted to church property and preserving things, and he didn't want the shroud to be taken by these invading forces. So it's said that just days or perhaps even hours before the forces came on horseback, he took the shroud and took it to central Turkey for safekeeping, right? To Cilicia there, right, in Cameliana. Now, when the Persian forces invaded, the, the destruction was complete. We have a document which states what happened when they arrived at Antioch, and I quote, those few who had not been killed or carried away as slaves could not find the site where had once been their homes, right? Now, Ephraimus died in the year 545. He wasn't able to bring it back to Antioch. So it stays in central Turkey, and we have some documents stating that priests would display this all right, it was known as the image of Cameliana. Today we call it the Shroud of Turin. Wherever it's at kind of takes that name, all right? Now, in 574, the, the central area of the Eastern Church was Constantinople. At that time, it was the full church. Right? We, Constantinople was in union with us, of course, at that time. And there were hundreds of relics there. And so the emperor had the shroud brought to Constantinople in 574 in, in great pomp. And it, too, was used to inspire the troops. There was a, an invasion by the Avars in the year 626 AD, and the shroud was paraded to inspire the troops before those battles. Okay? Now, look at the year on this one, the year 550. This is probably the most common thing that I think people can, can connect with. You, we've all seen these icons. This was the first one. This was the prototype of what we see for Christ's face. And it was found at St. Catherine's Monastery, which is located at the foot of Mount Sinai, right? As early as 550, all right? So this was made when the shroud was in Turkey. And if you take a, a transparency of the shroud face and impose it over this icon, all right? There are 150 points of congruence between this face and the face on the shroud. The only difference is here the eyes are open, and on the shroud the eyes are closed. All right, so the point is, the artist who made this, this is, by the way, is called the Pantocrator icon, Christ Ruler of could have only made this by looking at the shroud itself. So we're establishing the presence of the shroud as early as the year 550 there. Now, there, there's some uh, theology here as well. If you take that picture that we had and divide it in two parts, it actually fits in well with what we're talking about here today. The right-hand side, the right hand is raised in blessing. That is the mercy of God. The left hand is the book. That is the law. That is the justice of God. So we have mercy and justice in that icon here. And I think that fits in quite well with your theme of mercy and judgment. 
Uh, there are 27 rites within the Catholic Church. You've probably heard of many of these, the Melkite rite, uh, the, the Coptic rite, uh, the, the Carmelite rite, all right? And of these 27, one of them is called the Mazarabic rite. And it was very early on in, in the 500s, this rite was being practiced. Like the word says, it came from Arabia. And St. Leander was in Constantinople from 579 to 582 when the shroud was there. He was appointed a bishop in Spain. And when he went to Seville, Spain, with the Mozarabic rite, this is what he added to their liturgy. You may have never seen this before. Peter ran to the tomb with John and saw the recent imprints of the dead and risen one on the cloths. And they've been reading this ever since. And you know what week they read it on? The Sunday after Easter. So on this weekend, in those parts of the world where the Mozarabic rite is being practiced, they are saying this very reading. Whoops. Okay, I didn't want to leave out the Tremesis coin there. This is the year 692. This is called the Tremesis coin. All right? It was, it was patterned after the Emperor Justinian II. And the point here is that uh, this coin has been studied very much because it resembles a shroud. And Dr. Giulio Fonti from Italy wrote a book called The First Century After Christ. He devotes an entire chapter just to this coin that was minted in 692. And he finds that the points of congruence are so consistent with the shroud that he asserts in this book with greater than 99.99% certainty that the artist for this coin could have only produced those details by looking at the shroud. All right? And the arrow is pointing to this, this uh, line you see across the sternum here. All right? Now we jump to the year 1192. This is called the Pre, Pre Codex, the Hungarian uh, manuscript. It is in uh, present-day Hungary. This is the oldest surviving manuscript in the country of Hungary. It's currently in a museum library in Budapest. All right? And it depicts Good Friday and Easter Sunday. All right? Now, this wasn't necessarily made in 1192. It was listed in their inventory in 1192. It could have been made centuries before. All right? But there's some details here. For instance, you look at the top. There you see the body. And there you see the linen. And you see the right hand over the left which is what we see on the cloth image of the shroud. And you see four fingers, which is what we see on the shroud. Down below, there's much more detail. I'm going to enlarge Easter Sunday here, OK? Here are the women arriving at the tomb. The body is gone. The red crosses depict blood stains, we believe. Right? And then inside this circle, there's two other details that really point to the shroud, OK? Notice those lines over and up, over and up. Remember the three in one herringbone weave? Okay, the artist is trying to depict that linen weave there, and you'll see these four holes. Can you see them? One, two, three, four. If we match those holes up with holes found in the shroud, it's a pretty good match. And so we believe that whoever made that pre codex manuscript was looking at the shroud to get those kinds of details in there. So the point here is that these holes had to have gone on the shroud sometime before 1192. How did those holes get there? <clears throat> Well, because there's four sets of them, we know how the shroud was folded, right? And I'll get you in just a second here, okay? Philip, Philip's going to help me out here. You fold the shroud in half. Now it's eight cubits by one cubit. You fold it in half again, and now it's four cubits by one cubit. And right smack dab in the center are these holes. And it fits rather nicely over an altar. And I received permission to put this up here. This is a table. There's no relics inside this, but Father gave me permission to set this on there. And I have a, a cloth here <clears throat> that is the same size. It's a shroud. It's been folded just as you see. Now imagine if you had the shroud, what would you do with it? <clears throat> it might be venerated. Imagine the thurible being, in, you know, you're incensing the shroud, and the thurible hits the side, <clears throat> hits the side of, the, of the, the altar. And some hot coals, some hot coals from the thurible, the sensor, spill onto the shroud. And it will burn through those four layers in, in just a couple seconds, all right? And let's go ahead and hold this up for the nap. It's going to show you three things. It's going to show you the location of the holes. It's going to show you the size of the shroud. <clears throat> this is two cubits by eight cubits. And it's going to show you the water stains. Okay. <clears throat> you can unfold it. There we go. Let's hold it nice and tight for them. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, you can let that come down. There you go. <clears throat> OK, 
Okay, this is the actual size of the shroud, eight cubits by two cubits. Thank you very much, Philip. I'm, I hope you have insurance. I'm glad you didn't stumble down there. <laughs> As we say in the States, my bad. <laughs> I've got five minutes. I better move here. <clears throat> and <clears throat> this would have been the top layer, which would burn through first, this burned through second, the smaller coals have been brushed off, this boat burned third, and that burned fourth, and it all took less than probably two seconds. Okay. Now, many years ago, Dr. Jackson and, and his colleagues noticed an exaggerated treatment of the abdomen area, all right? Notice the exaggerated treatment, and on the shroud, we see this water stain, all right? And there we see right hand over left, and it became the prototype for what's known as the Man of Sorrows icon. Notice the, the, the artist's exaggeration of the abdomen area from that water stain and right hand over the left, which is how everyone saw the shroud on the cloth. In 1201, the shroud's location is confirmed. Nicholas Mezarites, the custodian of the imperial relic collection stored in the palace in Constantinople, he published an inventory of the items and he included the burial of Sindones of Christ. These are of linen. And in this place, he rises again, the burial cloth. What does it mean? that he rises again. We have an eyewitness account of a French knight who was in Constantinople just before the sack. Constantinople was sacked in the Fourth Crusade in 1203. And he writes that there was an, another of the churches of St. Mary of Bashone where there was kept the Sindonium, which our Lord had been wrapped, which stood up straight every Friday so the features of our Lord could be seen. All right, now over here we see these lines represent fold marks. And these have been confirmed by a, a process called raking lighting. You can lay the shroud out and spread light across it and see what these folds were. So A through G, those, that's how the shroud was folded. F is a block of wood. And you can imagine the shroud folded onto this and placed inside a box. And every Friday it was raised. And, the, and the, yes, many of us, we do the Stations of the Cross. What would you do if you had the shroud? You would venerate it on Fridays. One can imagine candles on each side as the faithful venerated the shroud. And that was an eyewitness account from one of the French knights that was in Constantinople in 1203, just prior to the sack. 1203, the sack of Constantinople. In this endeavor, uh, hundreds of relics were taken. And to this day, you can find them in churches across Spain, Italy, and France. What happened to the shroud? Well, the shroud shows up in Athens, Greece in 1206 and by a man named Othon de la Roche. He was appointed the... Uh, Duke of Athens, and he had taken part in the sack. He was originally from France, all right? And in 1230, he decides to move back to Burgundy, France. And in the year 1355, we hear about the shroud being publicly displayed uh, by a man named Geoffrey de Charnay. Now, how did he get it? It turns out his wife was Jean de Vergy. Her great-great-grandfather was Othon Leda Roche. And so it's quite possible that the shroud was passed down the family tree and she gave it as part of her dowry. All right? At this point, the shroud's history is very well documented. There was a lot of fighting going on this time across Europe in the 1400s and 14th century. And a matter of fact, Constantinople was taken over by the Muslims in 1453. And they, afraid of losing the shroud, they gave it to the most powerful family in Italy, the Savoys, the House of Savoy, perhaps you've heard of them. They ruled from the 10th century until the beginning of World War II. The king of Italy was the king of Savoy. He was the last reigning Savoy, right? And uh, the, he, in 1532 was when the fire occurred, right? And in 1538, Duke Philbert of Savoy decides to move to Turin in 1578. And since that time, it has been housed here in the, the uh, Cathedral of St. John the Baptist. This was built uh, in the late 16th century for the Shroud. And many times it was displayed publicly, sometimes to crowds of over 40,000 people or more at the same time. This one's taken in the year 1608. There's many, many of these. Then in 1898, Secunda Pia, an amateur photographer, took the first picture of the shroud. And when he saw that negative image, it just jumped out at him. He nearly dropped the glass plate it was on. And worldwide interest in the shroud began. And that brings us up to tomorrow. We're going to begin with this slide tomorrow, 1978, the Shroud of Turin Research Project. Okay. All right, I will entertain questions for, uh, it's, it's almost 1.30, I know I just got a minute or two, maybe take one or two questions. Uh, we've covered 19 centuries today, tomorrow we just have to cover one century. There'll be more time for questions. Perhaps you need some time to process this. I think with, if it's okay, uh, I know some of you are used to it for today rather than tomorrow, but uh, tomorrow I will answer any questions you have about the features and also questions you have about the 20th century. People want to know about the carbon dating test of 1988. 
Uh, looks like Bill's got the, uh, the mic for me. Is there one question? Well, we'll take two questions, okay, Bill? And then I'm going to let uh, Jess and Maya do their thing. How's that? <laughs> Is that Bishop Patrick back there? Bishop Patrick, I would like to present this to you. This is a copy of the critical summary. I know you're a busy man, but there's times you can get on the plane and you might be able to finish it. I would like you to have a copy of this. Okay. Uh, Bishop has his hand up. I better acknowledge that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Philip, I think you better give him the book. Could you please give him the book? He's, he'd like to have the book. I'll tell you, I'll bring it down to him, and you can introduce Jess and Maya. How's that? Thank you very much. of in the Gospels and the Shroud of Turin, are they one and the same? <clears throat> now the Shroud itself is exactly two cubits by eight cubits, which is 14 feet three inches long by three feet seven inches high. <laughs> if you can see the face there, the man on the Shroud is five feet ten inches tall. He is 175 pounds. And the blood stains that have been analyzed, you can see the blood stain from the side there, uh, have all been shown to be consistently from a male with type AB blood. Now what I want to do is, let's take the left hand side of this and we're going to blow it up for you, okay? Can everybody see the face here now? And this is actually a little closer to actual size. This is about half the size of the shroud, okay? You can see the face there. Uh, the most prominent feature are these scorch marks here. And these scorch marks happened in 1532. There was a fire <clears throat> that went through 16 layers of the shroud, the way it was folded, but it did not destroy the shroud. On the back side here, this is a Holland backing. It was sewn on by poor Claire nuns after that fire. This corner is missing, all right? What you see is a Holland backing that was sewn on in the 16th century. These are patches that the nuns sewed on. There you can see the right arm. You can see an exit wound of blood coming from the wrist, and as well as blood stains on that arm and the blood stain there. These are water stains here, all right? Now we're going to look at the left-hand side. The body would have been laid on, all right? Here is the back of the head, and you can see the blood stains from the cap of thorns there. You can see scourge marks. Now the PowerPoint you're about to see is mainly a summary of this document, the critical summary. All right? It was composed by Dr. Jackson and his associates at the Turin Shroud Center. Uh, tens of thousands of hours of scientific research over the last four decades, and they summarized it all in 75 pages and another 30 pages of reference. And I'll show you how you can download this for free. All right? I don't have a table back there because I'm not selling anything, but you can download this for free from the website, okay? And that way you can pursue it on your own. Now, here's Dr. Jackson on the left. This was at the most recent International Shroud Conference held in St. Louis back in October 2014. All right. He and his bishop, Michael Sheridan of the Diocese of Colorado Springs, they share a vision that the Shroud has been left to us for a purpose. And that providing people, if we provide people with factual information, they could come to their own reasoned judgment regarding its authenticity. So in September of 2018, 2014, the uh, bishop shared and decreed the formation of the American Confraternity of the Holy Shroud. The people may use the shroud as a most precious sacramental. And that's where this is leading. The shroud is a sacrament. It points us toward Jesus and the Blessed Sacrament. And as we deepen our relationship there, it helps us to become saints. Okay, that is where we're going with this. We're not here to win a scientific debate. Each of you can see the facts and decide for yourself. Yeah. Across the back. The blood stains across the back. Scourge marks the length of the body. You'll be able to see these better when I show you a photographic negative in a minute here. And down here you see the feet. There's the blood coming off the right foot. Blood coming off the left foot. Again, these scorch marks. You see the patches. Now right here you see the change in coloration. 
<clears throat> okay, about 150 years <clears throat> after the poor clear nuns sewed these on, they started to come off. And so the parish priest in Turin at that time was Blessed Sebastian Valfrey. And he had these sewn on. Those four there, and then that one there. Instead that he wept as the shroud was being sewn. St. Charles Borromeo was wept on the shroud. St. Francis de Sales has wept on the shroud. Many saints wept on the shroud. And then these holes right here, all right, we're going to get to them later, they did not happen. And the, they were on the, the shroud centuries before the fire. We'll get to them later. Right. This is a close-up of the, the shroud itself. It is 100% linen, okay? And there's a difference between cotton and linen. The shroud is linen, and it is for this reason that the corporal that's placed on an altar is linen, because our Lord's body was laid on a linen corporal. Right? It's called a three-in-one herringbone weave, and what it is, you go over three, under one, over three, under one, and then it shifts kind of like a stair step ladder. Now, this was a common stitching in ancient uh, Palestine in Jerusalem, all right? And it was found just before, during, and after the time of Christ. It is never found in Europe at any time in history. You know, what a privilege to be here in, in this year of mercy, on the Feast of Divine Mercy, to talk about an image of mercy in you know, our Savior Jesus Christ and the image on the shroud. And what an ideal place to be here in New Zealand for this Eucharistic Convention on this particular day. You know, I may be 10,000 miles from home, but I, I feel like I'm right where God wants me to be, and that you are right where God wants you to be as well. All right? We all share some appreciation for the Shroud, or we would not be here. But where has it been in its history? And, and what are these triangles there? And what are those shapes there? And what's that line across the chin? And what's that there? We're going to answer all those questions, and then some. But the most important question is, what is God trying to say to me? What is the message of the Shroud? And if we're willing to give some reflection to that question, and it can be a life-changing experience to the degree that we allow it to be. You know, all the shroud images you're going to see have been made with copyright permission of Barry Schwartz. He was the photographer of the Shroud of Turin Research Project in 1978. Uh, the format we're going to take here um, is uh, today we're going to divide it two parts, which is so much information. All right, we're going to begin with the features of the shroud, and then we'll cover its early history up to the, about the year 1900. All right, and we'll be done, and we're going to stop for some questions and answers. And I need to be done, you know, at 1:30, and I'll, I'll hit that. And then tomorrow we'll pick it up at that spot and allow time for questions for the shroud about the 20th century. Okay? Uh, tomorrow, whoops. Yeah, tomorrow we'll do its more recent history some current research and a few closing comments, right? And I invite you to, to read or listen to this next slide. I'll read it out loud in case those of you in the back can't see it. But to kind of prepare our hearts for what is it God wants us to get out of this, this next uh, few minutes here. One of our patron saints in America, St. Elizabeth Ann Seton, had this to say. When you begin to study, look up to him and think, O oh Lord, how worthless this knowledge would be if it were not for the enlightening of my mind for your service or for making me more useful to my fellow men. And so I believe this gives us a motivation for learning, you know, to be scholars, yes, but, but more importantly, become saints. And so we begin. Then, having bought a linen shroud, Joseph took him down, wrapping him in a linen, and laid him in the tomb. And here we have a depiction down here of Good Friday. The long linen shroud with the back side of the body against the ground, the front side with that, and then after the resurrection, we see the shroud displayed like this with the back side of the body there, the front side there. Is this linen spoken